Hello, welcome to Case Studies in Modern Development Practices on Non-Windows Deployment Systems. My name is Liz and I'm joined by Senior Consultants Dan Ellis and Kish Bailey and Don Fillion, Vice President of Professional Services. And then before we get started with this presentation, a little bit about the presenters um, in order of appearance. Don has more than 20 years of management experience in delivering technology solutions to businesses of all sizes. He joined Synergex in 2007 as a senior consultant in the professional services group. After successfully managing numerous large client engagements, he was promoted in 2009 to lead the PSG team as director of professional services. Dan Ellis started his career 30 years ago as a graduate developer at one of the largest Synergy DE software houses in Europe and quickly specialized in some of the more technical aspects of Synergy development. Since joining Synergex as a PSG consultant, Dan has worked as a business analyst and senior developer on large ERP projects. And last but not least, as a PSG consultant since 2012, Kish Bailey has consulted with over 30 Synergex customers on a variety of projects, lasting anywhere from a few days to over two years in duration. Along with other PSG project managers and developers, he has completed multiple OS migration projects, multiple traditional Synergy to Visual Studio slash Git projects, and dozens of projects enhancing customer applications. So without further ado, let's hear from these three presenters. Hello. My name is Don Fillion, and I lead the Synergex Professional Services Group. As has been the case throughout our history, Synergex is dedicated to supporting your application, leveraging the investment in your software so that it may be portable, extendable, scalable, essentially viable for the foreseeable future, clear through to the next century, as Bill mentioned in his welcome address. But what's it take for an application to remain viable over the long haul? Flexibility, modularity, and adaptability are important. And adherence to standards and adoption of best practices can certainly extend the lifespan of an application. Increasing your available pool of developers helps as well. And as such, incorporating state-of-the-art development tools into your environment not only serves to improve the user experience of existing developers, but also helps attract new resources as well. As PSG has been, from its inception, a remote workforce, we have adopted practices and incorporated technology that have allowed us to operate and even thrive in these challenging times of office closures and hybrid workforce. DevOps, a compound of development, dev, and operations, ops, describes the union of people, process, and technology, which seeks to continually provide value to customers. The capability of developing software in a robust, web-enabled, decentralized, yet secure fashion allows developers to increase productivity even while working remotely. Synergex has integrated its products with leading development tools, and PSG, as a consulting arm of Synergex, is often asked to help customers implement these tools and adopt software development best practices. And to be clear, while this tech may be Windows and web-centric, this certainly doesn't mean that you are limited in your runtime deployment options. These tools work in concert with any of the runtime compiler deployments we offer, OpenVMS, Linux, and Windows or .NET. In this presentation, we will walk you through some case studies and provide examples of how we have helped our customers implement best practices in situations in which Windows is not the deployment platform. Over to you, Dan. Thanks very much for that, Don. Um, so my name is Dan Ellis. I'm going to talk to you about a DevOps project we've done on OpenVMS. And then after that, my colleague Kish Bailey will talk to you about Visual Studio for Linux development. So as Don had mentioned, um, we have a, a large um, food distributor in this case using an MCBA-based system. Uh, they've been using it for over 25 years. Um, 
on a variety of different digital equipment and later HP machines. They're currently running on an Itanium using Synergy 951B. Um, and some of the issues that they have are they only have one copy of the source. They have no source code management um, in there at all. So they have lots of backups and copies of, of individual source files. Um, they do their editing in EDT on OpenVMS or sometimes in Workbench on Windows, and they have lots of obsolete code. So, you know, when we did a vendor expansion project for them, uh, we were searching through lots and lots of code that isn't even used, but because they didn't want to lose a copy of that or see what they'd done before, um, that was all, all still exists um, on the disk. So because they have no source code management, they don't have any audit trail or any traceability. So if they suddenly find a bug, something starts going wrong, they can't really look back easily and see what, what's changed within the software. And then obviously not having that audit trail, they have no ability to roll back any changes. And another big thing for us, because our first project was working on a field expansion, um, they, they don't have the capability to branch a version of their code. So we couldn't go off working on the vendor expansion, changing file sizes and, and repository structures without affecting their live environment and their production code. So that, that created quite a few problems for that project. Um, they also have no build or make file. Um, so one of the issues that we found was getting to grips with the new system was some production cost source didn't even compile. Um, and they didn't know that because they didn't have any kind of overnight job that would compile the, syst the, the system. And it also, it wasn't easy to create a new environment. So if you need to make a new QA environment or move to a different machine, um, there was no simple way to do that. You were just generally copying from another environment. Um, they've recently been um, acquired by a much, much larger company who had to have um, Sabian's Ox compliance, um, which not having any of this audit trail or traceability created a big problem, uh, particularly because developers had to log into the prediction system to install new code. So they asked us if there was anything um, that we could help them with about that, um, any, any experience that we had with this. Um, so what we suggested was that we we start to use Azure DevOps. It'll solve a lot of these issues. Um, so th for those of you that don't know, Azure DevOps, it's a cloud-based um, application lifecycle management system. It has lots of components and it, it's continually getting additional things added to it. Um, it starts out as for free for five users with a basic plan, and um, that includes an unlimited source code repositories, um, Azure boards, and pipelines, which we'll talk about a little bit later. If you want to add more users, uh, it's six pound six dollars, sorry, a month after that. Um, so we're going to focus on Azure repos, and we're going to touch a little bit on boards and pipelines. So Azure Repos, it's a hosted implementation of the Git source code management system, and, and that will be the, the focus of this session. So Azure Pipelines is a product to build, deploy, and, and test projects automatically. Um, and we'll touch on this as this is the next step that we need to do on this project for the customer, although we're currently um, in the discovery phase for that. Um, and Azure Boards is a browser-based product to plan, track, and report de development projects. Um, it has support for Scrum and Kanban built in, uh, which we'll, I'll show you a little demo of that later. So um, the process that we had to go through, we identified six steps that we need to do, uh, and I'll go into these um, one at a time. So the first thing was to identify um, where the current source code is located and then create a repeatable FCP script so we could get that source code, um, strip the version numbers off, which was actually harder than I'd anticipated because I couldn't get FileZilla to do it. Um, and, and so we could FTP the source code into a Windows environment for, for initial creation um, into Git, into a Git repo. Um, 
the customer used a repository schema file, but they had one big repository schema file, and they used they used the the repository GUI um, to change things in the schema. So what we needed to do to make it uh, to give them traceability and auditability um, within Git was to break. Um, those the the single schema file and down into individual schema files. Um, so I wrote a little program to do that. It was it was quite straightforward. And then we also, um, as we was doing that, we simplified the source code structure. We we, um, we we created a root of the source, and then things like subroutines go into one directory. Um, the repository schema is into another directory. XF server plus core source goes into another directory, um, et cetera, et cetera. So once that was done, we need to create a Windows environment um, because there is currently there is no Git client for OpenVMS. Um, BSI are working on a Git implementation for OpenVMS, but it's very much alpha at the moment. In fact, it's something uh, that Synergex are, are collaborating with them on at the moment. But um, for the foreseeable future, we have no Git um, client for OpenVMS. So the easiest way to do this is to create a Windows environment um, to commit and sync um, and branch um, the code from. And then from that Windows environment, automatically send any changes to OpenVMS. And, and it was pretty straightforward to do this task. So um, we need to create the environment to logicals on, on Windows to make sure that sort of like, you know, we could include things from the right area. Um, we need to create a repository build file. That was actually a little bit harder than anticipated because um, the, the customer used a lot of groups. So we needed to, to include um, schemas that were, that were used first. Um, we need, they need to be imported first before the schema that actually uses them as a group. Uh, and then we needed to create build files as well. So a build file for subroutines, identify all the live source code programs and build, make a build file for those. And then resolve any open VMS specific issues, um, which uh, for this particular set of source code was, was, was pretty simple. Um, and we have um, a set of open VMS stub libraries we use within PSG. Um, so that, that that we just add to the project compiling, and they take care of all the the um, DBL dollars, F dollars, and all those kinds of things within there. And then once that, once uh, we have a Windows environment, um, we can then edit it in any real any Windows editor. I'm going to show you a little video later of of it being edited in Visual Studio Code, um, but you can use Notepad Plus, um, Visual Studio. And then the customer is familiar with Workbench, um, so they actually use Workbench to, to do their editing as well. So the next step after that is to make a um, Microsoft Azure DevOps account. It's very easy to create a Microsoft DevOps site um, from your browser. Go to devops.azure.com. I'm using this with a personal account so that I can show you how to set up a new site. Um, click OK. And it'll ask you to create a project to get started. So we'll call our project OpenVMS. You can only make private pr um, projects. And if I do create project, there we go. We've got um, a nice empty project here. Um, so what we'll do next is we'll upload some source to it. So once we've created um, the DevOps site. We, we now need to push the code to DevOps. And again, there's lots and lots of options um, to do this. Um, there, there's a number of Git clients that you can use um, on Windows. You can push directly from an editor. Workbench has, an, has a Git client. Uh, VS Code does, which I'll show you, show you that um, later on. Visual Studio obviously has a, a very rich um, Git uh, functionality as well. Um, but for this, I use Tortoise Git. Um, I like Tortoise Git. It, it's built into Windows File Explorer. Um, 
and just find it's it's easy to use. It's easy to compare revisions, um, and it's easy to see what code needs to be, what hasn't been updated, and where you might have any any conflicts. Once we have our source on Windows, we can upload it to Git. So the first thing that we need to do is create a new repository. I've installed Git on Windows and Tortoise Git, which is a, a great free product to do that with. So on the directory that holds the source, we just right click and we can do Git create repository here. So now we've created a repository. Next thing we need to do is check in some code. So what we'll do is, um, now Git has two databases. It has the local database, which we're going to check into first, and then we're going to commit to the remote one, which is the DevOps site. So we'll do Git commit. We'll just commit to the branch called master. We'll call it initial check-in. And then we'll select all of the files. It, it'll give you an option to um, which files that you want to do. We'll select all of the files in there. So we've got 4,641 to commit. We'll do commit. And then there will be updated to our local database. So the next thing we can do is push. So we need to push to the DevOps site. So if we click push, we're going to push to master and it'll ask us what our name for our remote site is. So if we go back to our DevOps site uh, and we click on the repos tab, it'll give us the name of our, this is our site name. Actually, we can just copy it to the clipboard, sorry. Pop it into there. Do OK. It's going to push. What it'll do is it's going to ask us for um, authentication. I'm going to close that and it's going to ask us for our for the password. So again, if we go into here, back into um, DevOps. One of the options that we'll get is to get generate Git credentials. And then we can get our password below here. Pop it into there. And now, as you can see, it's updating all of the files into the repo. The nice thing about it is it will remember the username and password for the next time around. So you won't have to do that again. And then we're done. If I close that, go back to DevOps, we go to repos. We can now see all of the files are now checked into Git with uh, the comment for my initial check-in. Um, so once once we've got everything into Git, we've got our Windows development environment set up. The idea is we're going to do our editing um, on Windows. We're going to do our our um, commits and our syncs and any branching. We're going to do all of that on Windows. We can build the source code in Windows. We've created a Windows build environment. Uh, the only thing that we can't do is actually run it on Windows. Uh, we could have gone a step further. And we could have made the code run on Windows, but that was that was kind of outside the scope of, of this particular project. Um, so Synegex has created, uh, in order to get source code automatically from Windows to OpenBMS or, or indeed into Linux as well, um, Synegex have created an open source um, product called VMS Build Sync. Um, the URL to get it is, is, of, is in the presentation. Um, and basically what that does, you just run it from, you, you give it a command line, you'll need to give it um, your username and, pass, username and password and a directory to monitor on Windows and a directory structure to send to on OpenBMS. And then basically as you're working on your Windows environment, 
um, and you're editing files, you're committing them, um, you, or, or even if you do, um, if you switch branch, you switch to another branch on Windows and check out another branch, VMS Built-in will pick up all the changes to those files, and it will automatically send them over to to VMS uh, for you then to hop over to VMS and, and compile them. Because we're already using Git, Visual Studio Code has picked up the Git file on our local PC. Uh, you can see that we're in master, but if you look up here, you can see all of the other branches that we've created. We can, things like create new branches within here. If we now go and make a small edit to one of the source routines, we'll just add another line of code within here. I think, as you know, Visual Code has also got a Synergy plugin, so we get um, some element of code completion and colorization. And then once we've saved that, you can see that it says we've modified that particular program within here. If we go to the source code um, tab within there, we can also see here that we've modified that and we can decide what we're going to do with the changes. We can see the difference between the previous um, unmodified version and the modified version. And then what we can also do is we can add an update message to source control, which is already, it's already remembered from our previous one. Then we can do, we can commit it to our local repository And then once we've done that, as you can see, uh, we've got a local in the bottom left hand corner. We've got a local update already and we've got one that we need to push to DevOps. So it's saying there we need what we got one change to push. So we click the sync button and it synchronizes our changes back to Microsoft DevOps. We've got VMS sync running in the background. So that's picked up the changes. If we pop onto our VMS machine and have a look, you'll see there that we've just suddenly got a new version of that source code that's been pushed automatically. We can build it, and then we have it. We've, we've automatically synced and built onto VMS. So some of the other things that we talked about um, that are available with Azure is um, Azure boards. So um, we use an Azure board for this project. Um, the customer was already using um, Azure boards anyway for, for their for their non-Synergy development. Uh, but this is something that comes with DevOps. I find it really, really useful. Um, and, and as I said, there are a number of different um, project types that come uh, that that it just comes ready with to use, um, like Scrum and Kanban. But it, it's a really useful product for for managing development and to and to getting an instant um, view of where you are um, within any kind of development project. And it certainly beats um, at other places I've worked. We've we've actually had a huge magnetic whiteboard in the office uh, and we printed out all of the task cards or written on task cards or post-it notes and moved them from left to right across the across the board. So it certainly beats um, um, the, uh, the manual way of, of doing uh, a, a scrum boards. So um, as you can see from 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 what we did on this project, uh, we resolved a lot of the the SOX compliant issues. They've they've now got traceability and an audit of all source code changes. Um, one of the other things is each developer has got their own environment, so um, the the VMS build sync has been set up to sync to individual um, Sys dollar login home um, accounts on OpenVMS. So if I, I can create a branch to work on myself, I have that branch checked out on my PC and VMS sync then syncs that branch to my user account on OpenVMS. Um, I now have an OpenVMS build environment so I can build that whole new branch in my local user account. Uh, so I can work on that without um, having any negative effect on any of the other developers on the system. So, so the ability to branch 
and have your own specific working environment is 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 really powerful and really helped us out with it um, ultimately on our vendor expansion project. So what we've also done is we've rationalized a lot of source code. So all of those copies um, and backups and things, they're all they're all gone. They're not needed anymore. Um, because obviously we've got the the traceability and the audit um, of all the, the source code. So when we're doing uh when we're looking at um, for instance, where we might have missed a, a vendor code that we need to expand, we won't be seeing old source code or backed up source code anymore, which is, as developers not so familiar with the system, we may not know that that's obsolete. And we've also created a modern um, development environment um, for, for, you know, so it's much easier to bring new developers on. Um, you don't really have to use the open VMS environment that much. Uh, you, you, yeah, you have to log in, you have to compile your code on there and, and run it for testing, but all of your editing um, can take place um, on Windows in, in an editor of your choice, really. And then obviously the customer also has all of the other benefits of DevOps. So using the boards, DevOps also has bug tracking within there. You can also create tests uh, and track test runs uh, within DevOps as well. A couple of projects for the future for this customer is um, making the whole um, solution build within Visual Studio. It's not too much of an extra step now. Um, again, as, as a PSG consultant, I tend to be working in lots of other customers um, and lots of other customers' environments that maybe I'm not absolutely familiar with. So having it available in Visual Studio is great for somebody who's not that experienced in the environment. If I want to, if there's an include in there and I want to know, you know, what what that include has in it, I can just, you know, go to the go to the definition within Visual Studio. I can easily see where anything's referenced. Um, and the debugger obviously is is much, much better in Visual Studio. And then one of the other key things that, that we'll be doing as, as a next step is if we're creating a deployment pipeline. So this is another um, Azure feature. You can actually, um, within Azure, you can, you can create a series of steps. So you can check out a branch um, to a local directory. You can then push the contents of that branch to a remote, remote, remote machine. In this instance, an open VMS machine, and then you can use SSH to actually compile that branch um, on the remote machine and, and see what the status of that is. So some of the things that you can do if you've got a proper deployment pipeline is obviously that is another tick in the box for SOX compliance. You can have authorization steps along the way. So you can say, right, we're going to do a release from dev to QA. So developers can authorize that. Then QA can then test the, um, the 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 changes in QA. They can say, "Yep, that's okay. We think we we've tested that." And then somebody who's authorized to do the production in Dev can then say, "Yep, okay, based on the QA results, I'm going to give it the okay to to deploy to production." And that's all done in a controlled and auditable environment. Um, another nice thing if you've got um, um, deployment pipelines, you can set up a continuous integration or continuous delivery build um, so that you can build your software automatically um, overnight. Or also you can do something that I like, which is a gated check-in. So if you're, uh, if you're basically you've changed a bunch of code on, on, your, on your PC and you commit that code to Git, um, you can automatically kick off a build of that code and if the build fails, it will reject the commit and email you and say, you've just checked in some code that is bad. Um, you need to go and fix it. So obviously that will uh, resolve a lot of quality issues um, with b before they even get to QA. Nobody will be able to check in code that, that doesn't compile. So that, that's another sort of real key feature of, of using deployment pipelines. So that's the end of my particular part of this um, of this presentation. Um, I'll hand you over to Kish now, and I'll, but I'll be around at the end to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hello, my name's Kish Bailey, and I'm a senior developer with the PSG Group. Uh, when working with new uh, PSG customers, we typically want to perform a system assessment to get a deeper understanding of their current application environment and provide recommendations for improving uh, that development environment as well as their production uh, environments. 
Last year, we assisted this Midwest Steel Company with a system assessment, which resulted in certain recommendations, which I'll be talking about in my presentation. Since the system assessment, PSG has been engaged in a managed services project with this customer. The managed services project allows us to provide additional development and project management resources in order to implement our recommendations. So let me talk a little bit about the pre-engagement state. This customer uses Linux as their primary production server. Um, editing is done in VI for Synergy code. They also have some visual uh, basic uh, applications uh, that use XF Server Plus clients. There's no single location for the source code. Some of it's on the production server, some of it's on a developer's PC. There's no development or test server, only the production uh, servers are available. They also did not have any source code management. Uh, Dan talked about some of the uh, problems with uh, no source code management. There's no audit trail, traceability, no rollback. Uh, backing up the source code was actually done manually uh, via some cron jobs, uh, as well as some uh, Windows batch jobs. They did not have any build or make files. So some of the uh, production uh, source uh, wouldn't even compile. Um, a high percentage of these that, that would not compile were considered obsolete. The other problem with not having a build or make file is that the build requires knowledge of the source relationships, something we call tribal knowledge. Um, it's very difficult then to take that information and add on additional developers to, uh, to the project because now they have to understand what the relationships are between the, the various source code. There's also no way to test build uh, all of the code for errors and or obsolete code. There's also no SOX compliance, as uh, Dan mentioned uh, previously, uh, the developer has to log into the production system to build and install code. So let me talk a little bit more about the customer. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, customer is a Midwest Steel Company. Um, they have the one Linux production server running their main ERP. The application is written in traditional Synergy. Uh, they do have Visual Basic clients uh, that uh, are running over XF Server Plus. A lot of the users are, are using the, the client applications uh, mainly to run the, uh, the shop floor, whereas the traditional Synergy applications are more for the back office. They also have one Windows production uh, server only running payroll. They have several hundred users, mostly on Linux and or the, the VB applications. So it's not a small site uh, by any means. As I mentioned, a system assessment is where we typically want to start with a new PSG customer. So what is a system, system assessment? It's a two week engagement where we spend 40 hours at the customer site, interviewing the stakeholders, uh, looking at the environment, and then finishing with 40 hours back in the office, organizing our findings and producing a post-consulting report with our recommendations. Since 2020 precluded visiting the customer site, we did all of this in Teams. I believe it was the first Teams, uh, all Teams or remote uh, system assessment that we performed. So what was the system assessment of this customer? Well, it allowed PSG to review the current state, their architecture, their software, as well as the de de development environment and development resources. It also allowed us to define some gaps. Specifically, we found that uh, they had no development server um, and only a single development resource. And then finally, taking that information, we generated our recommendations in the, in the form of a post-consulting report. So what happens after the system assessment? Well, the customer can take our recommendations in the PCR and implement them without further assistance from PSG. Or they can choose to engage PSG in one of two ways. As managed services, where PSG resources are assigned, the advantage with managed services is that the customer, customer knows the cost up front, it's fixed. Um, PSG provides a team of PSG resources, including project managers, the senior and junior developers, and then we can always bring in additional members with specialties uh, to the team as needed. Or they can choose to implement the recommendations using a statement of work where 
we would work on a project by project basis. With a statement of work, the cost is time and material, and therefore the cost can vary. And the team typically is fixed for the life of the project, simply because the projects tend to be a lot shorter. This customer chose to engage a managed services approach. PSG provided a team comprised of project manager, a lead developer, and a junior developer. One recommendation was to migrate their source code into Visual Studio to provide a more modern editing experience. We also recommended that their source be kept in source code control. In this case, our recommendation was to use Git. For this customer, the migration process started with zipping up their source code. PSG then created a Git repository using the PSG DevOps site. One of the first things that we do is to push the source code as received directly from the customer to maintain the integrity of the original source code. Once it's been pushed to Git, we then assign access to all the stakeholders, including PSG developers, project managers, as well as customer developers and project managers. The developers will clone the repo locally, and then from then on, all work is done on the cloned repo. Developers will then periodically push changes to the DevOps re repo uh, to allow other developers to have access to the new code. We never want to push code that fails to build as this disrupts other developers on the team. Another recommendation that came out of the post-consulting report was to upgrade the customer Synergy DBL version to the then current version 11. I believe the customer was already at 10, so it wasn't a large hop for them. We upgraded one Linux and one Windows server to version 11.1.1D. Once we had their source code in Git, we then spent approximately two weeks to create a Visual Studio solution using that code. PSG would build a Visual Studio solution using the contents of the Git repo. A Visual Studio solution organizes the source code into projects and solution folders. Once we have the customer source code, the first task is typically to create one or more Visual Studio solutions. A solution organizes the code into buildable units called projects, where a single project produces a single type of executable. For example, a project may build a single DBR, a single OLB or ELB, a Synergy repository file, or multiple DBRs. The key point is that a project can only produce one type of executable, so you cannot have a project that produces both a DBR and an ELB. They must be separate projects. The solution can contain other files that may or may not contribute to building the executables. These are typically kept in a solution folder rather than in a project. This is because solution folders do not produce any executables. They are just containers for files. Files such as record definitions, screen or report layouts, and even batch script files can, be, can typically be found in solution folders. They are added to the solution to allow developers to use the same Visual Studio editing tools when modifying these files as they would, as they would be used to modify source files within each project. We typically require two or more weeks to create the solution. You want to spend time in designing how to organize the files to provide the best view of the customer source and, and to allow for ease of maintainability. The other reason it can take time is that this may be the first time the customer's entire source code has been built and therefore the likelihood of finding obsolete or otherwise non-buildable code is high. Note that more than one solution may be created during this phase. In this particular customer case, we created three solutions. One for their main ERP system, a second for their payroll system, and a third that contains XF Server Plus routines that they use for Visual Basic applications. Creating the solution is typically done by repeatedly performing the same steps until the solution no longer produces any build errors. The first step is obviously to create and organize projects. We typically create one project at a time, starting at the lowest levels, such as a project that contains common subroutines and functions. We then attempt to build that project until it produces no errors before moving to the next project. If you're extremely lucky, you may be able to build the projects without any errors, but I've never been that lucky and I've done close to a dozen migrations to Visual Studio over the last several years. More likely, the build will produce errors, 
and you will have to resolve each one. In collaboration with the customer's developers, you may conclude that a program fails to build because it's obsolete. In that case, you'll want to move the source file to an obsolete directory and remove it from the project. The key point is that we never want to delete any obsolete source files, just in case we determine later that it is usable code. If a program fails to build but is not obsolete, the problem may be due to coding styles that were allowed in prior DBL versions but is no longer allowed or discouraged in the new version. In that case, the code must be modified. Note that PSG always tries to make small changes to customer code, one that fixes the build error but does not introduce any runtime issues. The key takeaway is that as errors are discovered and fixed, the changes should be documented. The documentation helps the other developers from creating new code that will produce similar errors and also helps them to better understand best coding practices. Note that in this particular customer's case, they had one-off programs, sometimes called fix-it programs, that did not build but were otherwise not obsolete. The decision was made not to move them into an obsolete folder, since they could be used again in the future, assuming the build errors are fixed. They were, however, removed from the project to allow the rest of the programs in the project to build. As you're fixing errors, removing programs from the solution, or moving programs to other projects, it's a good idea to push changes to the Git repo on a regular basis. The key is to save your work often, just in case you make a mistake that requires rolling back to a prior version. Rinse, lather, and repeat until all projects in the solution build error-free. Repeat with the other solutions. Once you are able to build a solution without any build errors, it's time to test. As we all know, just because a program builds does not mean it works as intended. That means deploying the executables to the target server when then having users run the programs. This customer runs the main ERP application on a Linux server. You may ask, why would we want to put their code in Visual Studio on a Windows platform when the production server is Linux? Well, because Synergy DBL executables created on Windows will run on Linux. That means that once you build it on Windows, you could simply move the executables to the target Linux server and test the changes. No separate build is required on the Linux server. If you recall, one of the recommendations for this particular customer was to stand up a development server. Since it is bad practice to test on your production server, the executables were first copied to the new development server, then one or more users are asked to test the programs. Only when the users are satisfied should the same executables be copied to the production server. Note that testing should be done by subject matter experts. Also note that since this development server is new, this also tests the server configuration matches that of the server. In order to deploy or publish the executables to the target server, either the development or production server, we provided a Windows batch file to the customer. The batch file must be configured for the customer since it requires knowing which directory or directories Visual Studio deposits the executables and where on the target server those executables must reside. The batch program is passed a single argument that determines whether the target is the development or production server. Note that the target may also be a different server, such as the Windows server that is used for payroll. These can all be easily configured in the batch file to meet the needs of the customer. As we all know, the target servers may have active users running applications while attempting to publish. The batch file can detect this and is able to replace the executable such that once the old executable is no longer in use, the new executable will be slotted in. Note that this is not always possible. For example, ELBs may remain in use for a very long time, in which case we would need to publish ELB changes when there are no users on the system. PSG is still actively engaged with this customer, starting from the system assessment that was completed in mid-2020. In addition to the work described above, we are currently working on an EDI implementation as well as converting their smart item number into one that can allow for many more items. Future considerations for this customer may include 
having the customer host their master Git repository. Note that currently that master is hosted on an Azure DevOps that PSG controls. We often provide this service at the start of any engagement when the customer does not already host their own Git repository. Another possible enhancement is to create pipeline builds that automatically build the solution whenever new or modified programs are added to the Git repository. One other future consideration may be to stand up a development server for payroll. And there are many other recommendations that come out as we become more familiar with both the business and the applications used by this customer. I strongly believe that managed services agreement allows flexibility on additional future work that may be more difficult to implement in an SOW type of environment. So to recap, PSG provided an initial assessment to this customer. From that system assessment, a set of recommendations were provided on improving their processes and infrastructure. The customer chose to have PSG assist with implementing the recommendations using a managed services model, augmenting their current development staff with PSG personnel from various disciplines. We believe this is a great example of how these types of projects should work. So who has the first question? To start with the Q&A, it looks like we have a question from Rachel. Can you also compile on Windows and copy to AIX? Okay, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, yes, Rachel, you can. Um, we the, the 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 product that we created is, although it's called VMS Build Sync, I think maybe because it was initially intended for um, for us to um, sync over to VMS, it actually uses um, SFTP. So as long as you have a you, your AIX machine can accept SFTP connections, which I believe the last time I worked on AIX, it can. Um, you can set it up um, to sync to to AIX. And, and I believe now internally, Synergex also use VMS build sync to sync to, to Linux as well, to our various Linux and Unix boxes that we support. Excellent. One other quick plug while we're here, um, we do have the networking session following our second session of today. Um, so you will be getting a link for that if you haven't already in the upcoming session directly following this one. Um, I don't see any other questions so far. Again, thank you to our three presenters for the information you provided. Let's see. We do have a question from Alan. Is the publishing done automatically after each Visual Studio build? Okay, I think um, I'll let Kish take this one. In in this particular case, uh, with with this customer and also with another customer that uh, we use the uh, the publishing uh, batch program, um, it is a manual process. It's uh, uh, we wanted to be able to control when it goes out to production, um, but there's certainly no reason why we couldn't automate it. Uh, for example, in Visual Studio, you can have a pre and a post uh, build uh, batch that uh, gets executed, and we could just add it uh, to, to within Visual Studio so that when you get a successful build, um, then it will uh, perform the, the, the publishing. Um, so it's really a matter of choice. Uh, you know uh, how how much control you want to have over what gets into in, into production. I would I would almost take a a two step approach and, and maybe say um, you ought to, you do a, an, an automated uh, 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 publish uh, to the development server, uh, but when it comes for, to the production server, that's a manual process. Uh, so again, maybe another team uh, would be responsible for that. Um, you know, kind of like uh, what, what Dan was talking about, uh, where there would be a, a team that's responsible to make sure that production is uh, is updated uh, when they deem it, uh, uh, you know, uh, viable. So thanks for that question. And Brett Cole asks, how does one reference external libraries or symbols that are not in Synergex DBL code that are only available on OpenVMS when setting up a Visual Studio environment? 
Uh, I guess I'll I'll take that one initially, and Kish might pipe in as well because he ha he has experience of using um, our PSG VMS library. So the the VMS library is in two parts. It does actually have a, a dot include of um, DBL Starlet, I think, which has defines um, the, some of the VMS specific um, symbols and, and variables that you might need to use. And then it also has, um, it, it compiles into an ELB, but it has all the source code for things like um, F dollar, get logical if I remember that, um, and, and things like that. So it, it basically has a, a stub um, subroutine for all of the VMS specific libraries and where we can make them work. Um, and, and they don't, in, they don't need VMS. We make them work. If not, we just sort of return uh, we just return success back because um, they, they're generally just used to make the system compile um, on Windows or, or other environments. I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that one, Kish. Yeah, uh, so so it's very important to to realize that uh, we, you know, the, this the VMS Live project that uh, we, we've made available um, contains uh, most of the basic things that uh, we, we can replicate in a uh, non-VMS environment. Uh, things that are very specific to uh, VMS, such as uh, authorization, security, rights, uh, typically you know, security related, there's just no way to, 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 be, uh, to replicate that in a non-VMS environment. So as Dan said, uh, you know, in, in those cases, we, we may create a stub, or if you are actually migrating uh, off of VMS, which is the times that we've used this uh, particular uh, project in the past, then that's the time to be looking at that part of your code anyways, and determining, you know, what, um, what do we need to change in order to make it work, uh, you know, in a Windows or, or Linux environment where some of those VMS specific uh, routines are unavailable. So we can, we can get you to the point to, to, to build it, uh, but to actually execute it um, requires a little effort on both our part, uh, PSG, and, uh, and and your part, the customer, uh, to uh, if if you're in fact uh, migrating off of VMS. And Tim Laverne asks, on Open VMS, we use cascading directories. Dev contains modules and development, but picks up code during compiles from test and deployment environments. How does this impact the pipeline? Oh, thanks for that, Tim. <laughs> what um, what the plan would be is obviously cascading logicals are quite often used as branches. So as you mentioned, um, if this logical is set up, um, this logical set up to look in the test directory first, and if there's code in there, pick the code up from the test directory. If not, pick it up from dev, et cetera, et cetera. So we would recommend that you flatten those cascading logicals and you only have those ca that cascading directory and you only have you know, one directory for source, one directory for includes. And if you want to replicate the functionality that you're talking about, is that's where you would create a branch in in DevOps. Um, so, you know, if you want to, to test a specific, you know, a, a specific test branch, make a branch for that and change the code in that branch. Hopefully that's that's clear. Perfect. And the follow-up question from Brett, he says, thanks, are these stubbed out definitions available? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> they, they, they absolutely are. Uh, uh, again, uh, you know, we, we've, we've created them uh, kind of, a, you know, in general for a couple of different uh, customers. We've, every time we've had to use them, um, we'll expand on it a little bit. Obviously, it's probably not going to be complete but you know, it may get you uh, seventy percent, eighty percent of uh, of the way if if you choose to do that. Um, uh, I don't happen to have the uh, uh, the link right off the top of my head, but uh, we can make sure that uh, that you get that. Yeah, they they are updated all the time, as as Kish mentioned. For this particular project, I had to make um, I had to add a couple that were missing. Um, so I yeah, I, I think. Steve's put them on that GitHub. I thought they might have been on our PSG DevOps, but we'll find out where they are and, and post that as part of the resources. Yeah, it looks like Marty has posted the open source stub VMS compatibility library link in the chat area. So okay. thank you, Marty. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, 